Hello there and welcome back to another video. In today's video, the final shout for 2023, I'm going to be building a DIY computer power supply tester. I don't have a purpose-built power supply tester and I'd like to have one to make my life far easier if I ever need to test a computer's power supply during a diagnosis. I've got a few things I want this power supply tester to be able to do. I want it to measure the voltage of each rail as that's a pretty crucial function for a power supply tester. I also want it to be able to put a load on the power supply and lastly, it needs to be quite accurate. So let's get to testing out an idea I have on how to do all of these things with an Arduino. Here I'll build up a little voltage measurement and PSU rail loading circuit to get some tests done before I lock in my design. I'm using an Arduino Nano for the microcontroller, a 10 watt, 10 ohm power resistor to load the voltage. In this case, this will draw about 1.2 amps from the 12 volt rail, which is what the circuit will be tested with. And then I've got two resistors and a voltage divider configuration across the rails voltage and ground. I'm using a 6.8 kilo ohm resistor for resistor 1 and a 3.3 kilo ohm resistor for resistor 2 because this will allow the 5 volt max of the Arduino's ADC to not be overloaded when measuring up to about 15 volts. With the circuit built up and a little bit of code written to figure out what the input voltage of the voltage divider is, if you have the output voltage as well as the resistor values, I turned up the voltage on my bench power supply and noticed that the results were only semi-accurate. When my bench power supply was outputting 12 volts, the Arduino was measuring about 11.45. That's not horrible off, but for this device, it's far too inaccurate. Remember how I mentioned that I used a 6.8 kilo ohm resistor as well as a 3.3 kilo ohm resistor? Well, the thing with resistors, especially when you're buying resistors that cost less than a cent each, like I am, is that they're pretty much never the value they're sold as. Every resistor has a tolerance, usually a percentage, which defines by what percent of the marketed value the resistor's actual value is allowed to be off. So a 100 ohm resistor with a 5% tolerance could actually be anywhere from a 95 to a 105 ohm resistor. This usually isn't the biggest issue, but in this use case with a voltage divider, it's what's causing that 0.55 volt discrepancy between my power supply and the Arduino's measurement. Therefore, I measured the exact resistance of the resistors in this voltage divider and edited the code's values to reflect that. And then, instantly, the Arduino's measurements were almost spot on. Only a couple of millivolts of error, which is more than acceptable for this use. Well, with the main part of the design's circuitry tested and confirmed to be a functional design, it was time to get to building this tester with the help of a custom piece PCB that I ordered from today's video sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay provides many high-quality manufacturing services at affordable prices, including CNC machining, 3D printing, PCB assembly, and PCB production. Today, I've ordered something through their PCB production service, and it's these PCBs which are going to allow me to easily build up my tester and have a nice little tool to add to my collection. I inspected the PCBs after pulling them out of their package, and they looked perfectly suitable for my project. Now, in combination with a bunch of electronic components I had in stock, it's time to get building. I won't bore you with all the soldering of this board because you're not here to see mediocre quality solder joints. So with nearly all the components soldered to this board, it was time to get the voltage divider resistors installed. As I demonstrated earlier, it's really important to measure the exact value of each resistor in each voltage divider to maintain an accurate voltage reading. So while referencing my schematic, I wrote down the exact value of each resistor as I put it into its correct spot and soldered it into place. At the end of all this, I had a page filled with resistor numbers and their exact values, which will become very important when writing the code for this tester. All right, every component is now soldered onto the board here, except for the three at the top, the main power supply connectors. I was originally considering going through my scrap circuit board pile and desoldering an 8-pin EPS, 24-pin ATX, and an 8-pin PCIe connector, but after only being able to semi-successfully desolder an 8-pin EPS-like connector, I realized that I didn't even want to think about desoldering a 24-pin motherboard connector. I also looked online for the right Molex connectors that will match the standard PC power supply connectors, but the only only ones I could really get would take too long to come and were a little pricey. This led me to cave and, as much as I wanted male connectors soldered directly to the board, I'd end up using some cut cable extensions. So I went out and ended up buying a set of these Cable Matters sleeved cable extensions. I originally was planning to get super cheap cable extensions for just the motherboard, EPS, and PCIe cables, but even with the cheapest extensions for each of those three cables I could get on Amazon, this Cable Matters set was slightly cheaper at a mere $16 for the entire set. So even though these are somewhat nice cables to be cutting up, it was the cheapest way to do this, so here we go. And while I'm at it, here's a super short review of these extensions if you're interested in them. I got the white cables and they feel good. The wire gauge seems to be fine at a solid 18 AWG, and the sleeving feels decent, connectors are right, and overall the cables are nicely flexible. The only thing to be wary of with these white extensions is that one of them was a slightly stained off-white color compared to the other five. I'm not too sure what's up with that, but other than that they seem like acceptable quality extensions. I marked 10 centimeters off from the male connector of 
the cable extension, then cut and stripped the wires. I started with the EPS cable because it's one of the simplest ones to get right, and I'd really rather not solder any of these cables on backwards. That would be a nightmare, especially the motherboard connector. I went ahead and soldered the cable to the board and repeated these exact same steps with both the 8-pin PCIe and 24-pin motherboard cables. This left me with a circuit board that has a bunch of cables growing out of it, but that's the goal, so this is going quite nicely. I also put the 9-volt battery clip onto the board, as I'd forgotten about it earlier, and while I'm mentioning that, I bet some of you are wondering why I didn't make this tester powered off of the power supply that it tests. And the reason I have for that is that I wanted to be able to control the power of the power supply and the power of the tester separately. And I also didn't want to touch the standby rail of the power supply as that's quite important for testing. Combined with a hot glued 3D printed 9 volt battery holder whose 3D model I stole from my CMOS battery tester project, this tester is ready to be programmed. Oh coding, my one sworn enemy. This will certainly be the most confusing and annoying part of the project, right? As a start, I flashed the Adafruit SSD1306 test sketch onto the Arduino Nano and powered the board up to make sure that the OLED screen was working correctly, before I sat down for hours and made a full program for it. To no one's surprise, the screen worked just fine and now I can move to the actual programming. In my CMOS battery tester video, I said that I wouldn't go into too much detail of how the program worked, and then I ended up proceeding to explain it in decent detail. This time, however, I will not be explaining this program in detail because, quite frankly, it's far too long for that. I also won't go into the surprisingly small amount of debugging that I had to do on this program because even then, it's still too long. What I will give you though is a basic rundown of the functions that this program provides the PSU tester board with. This tester works by waiting for user input to start its test of the power supply. It can perform two types of tests, a loaded test and an unloaded test. When the user presses the power supply on off button, the tester will power on the unit with no load on any rails except the standby rail which is perpetually loaded, waits for two seconds, samples the voltages, waits two more seconds, samples again, and does one more wait sample cycle. After each sample, it holds the results to a variety of specs, ATX, ATX without PCIe, and Dell. Yep, that's right. The other connector I put on the board is the connector that nearly all of Dell's SFF power supplies seem to use. So this tester seamlessly integrates with the Dell power supplies that I find myself working with all the time. Anyway, the tester logs the results of those three tests, and if the unit is good, it should fail and pass each of the specifications the same way all three times that it sample. If it doesn't do this, something's wrong and the tester will throw an error. This just helps to ensure that a power supply doesn't have a rail that, for whatever reason, may only be getting up to voltage, say, 5 seconds after the unit's powered on. If there's no inconsistency error among the three times it tests the unit, then the tester will display the results of the power supply and allow the user to cycle through the menus and view the voltages of all measured rails. Then, the other type of test is a loaded test, which is activated if the user presses the load on-off button instead of the power supply on-off button when starting the power supplies test. This will enable the load resistors, which are set to draw approximately one amp from each rail. In any case, the test functions in the exact same way other than the tester turns off its load once the test is done. Honestly, I'm pretty proud of that functionality if I do say so myself. It was a bit of a nightmare to program, but after sufficient testing with the Dell SFF PSU that I'd been using to debug it, as it's the lowest wattage unit I had on hand, it was time for the final test, the full ATX power supply. So I pulled out an old Corsair CX450M, which I pulled from a computer I thought I was going to flip, but ended up repurposing instead and plugged it into the tester. All right, time to see if it tests. Everything should be set correctly and hopefully the unit powers right up and tests good. Well, needless to say, based on the lack of fan spin on the power supply, it didn't work quite right. The power supply didn't so much as turn on, even though it should be getting the correct signal to be turning on. I know that the circuitry which connects the green signal the wire to ground works because it was powering on the Dell power supply, so how come it isn't working here? I'll be skipping my strange troubleshooting here too, but I concluded that I'd managed to do the one thing I was very careful not to do. I soldered the 24 pin connection on backwards. Yeah, of all things to mess up, I was aware that this would be the most annoying and somehow it was the one thing I managed to solder wrong. So yeah, how lovely that was to flip around. And while I'm working on flipping this connector, I'd like to point out the slightly messed up Dell connector which has randomly appeared. Before anyone comments regarding what happened there, one of the pins of the connector got damaged when I desoldered it, and I thought that it was an unimportant connection, but I messed up and it turns out that it was actually the standby rail, so I had to fix that up with a bit of wire jumpers. I also had to change the voltage divider and load for the standby rail because I also somehow missed that these Dell units have a 12 volt standby rail instead of a 5 volt standby rail. I guess that while designing this tester it was just one of those days. Oh well, I've got the motherboard connector flipped now as well as everything else fixed, so let's test it once more. Still no dice, and something has also burned this time. 
Thankfully, the high quality trace in this PCB didn't actually break, but the solder mask ended up a little crispy. Looking back, I think that was the standby rail of the Corsair unit, which means that I just shorted 3 amps through a 1mm width trace. Don't think that was a good idea, and I'm not surprised that a 1mm trace couldn't quite take the heat. I also tried a different power supply, just to see if there was some weird behavior with the way that the Corsair unit powered on, but this Dell OEM power supply also behaved identically. Clearly an issue with my tester then. Now I didn't film too much of this part because I was already nearing 350 gigabytes of raw footage, but I ended up realizing that I managed to pick the one footprint for the 24 connection, which was mirrored. Yep, mirrored. So the connector was definitely soldered on wrong originally, but also still wrong after flipping it, and it would need to be moved to the back to work correctly. And because I didn't like the idea of two connector cables on the front and one on the back, I moved the other two to the back as well. This was really painful to do and took a while, but in the end it actually turned out better than before. Now the tester stands up like a little tent even when plugged in, and I'm really pleased with the end product, because flipping this connector like this fixed everything. I'm going to demonstrate the full functionality of my little testing device to you here in just a moment, but firstly I'd like to point out that this PCB from PCBWay has been through the ringer with all my design mistakes, shorting a few amps through thin traces, and several solder desolder cycles that, in hindsight, were at far too high an iron temperature, and even then it still hasn't failed. None of the pads came off from the excessive heat and movement they were subjected to when putting the 24 pin connector on three whole times. The solder mask might have gotten a little burned when I shorted a bunch of current through a trace that should not have had that kind of current put through it, but it still didn't melt or pop, and overall, it's just held up surprisingly well. So, one more big thanks to PCBWay for providing a quality product that made my project possible. Check them out at the top link in the description below. Alright, let me show you what I've created here and what this little board can do. Here I've got my full ATX power supply connected, with motherboard, 8-pin EPS, and 8-pin PCIe connected. Also, the PCIe connector can just have a 6-pin table plugged into it, and the EPS connector can also receive just a single 4-pin and work just fine. Doing an unloaded test shows that the power supply passes both the ATX and no PCIe ATX requirements, but not the Dell ones because the standby rail isn't at 12 volts. I can view all the voltages that the board is currently getting from the unit, and turn off the unit. Then, I can also perform a loaded test which does the same thing but with the power resistors enabled. The load automatically disables once the test is done so that it doesn't get too hot, but I can manage re-enable it with the button while cycling through and watching the voltages. Here's a quick demo of what would happen if the power supply didn't have the same pass-fail results for all three tests that are taken while the unit's being tested. I'll simulate this by leaving the CPU power unplugged and then plugging it in a bit through the testing cycle so that the unit fails its first one or two cycles for all the specs, but then passes the last cycle when the CPU rail comes back. I'm not sure if this feature will ever catch any bad units, but if for some reason a single rail on the unit is lazy or slow to come on in a power supply, this should find that. The board throws an error, fails the unit, and powers it down. Pretty cool, I think. It also works the exact same way in a loaded test, but it turns off the load too when the error is thrown. What if I'm testing an OEM ATX unit that doesn't have any PCIe supplemental power cables? Well, obviously it won't pass the ATX test because there's no PCIe power, but it will pass the no PCI ATX, which is exactly what it sounds like. The ATX test, but it ignores the PCIe rail. I'm demoing this with an old Dell OEM unit that has a 24-pin motherboard connector and a 4-pin EPS connector. You can see that the unit passes the no PCI ATX spec, just as designed. And lastly, my favorite little party trick of this DIY tester, the Dell SFF power supply. Plugging the motherboard connector into the connector that's built into the tester's board, and the CPU connector into the regular EPS connector, it can be tested in the exact same way, and here you can see the power supply passes the Dell spec. I think that this project was a massive success, even if it took a bit of blood, sweat, and tears to get it functional. I'm really happy to have a power supply tester like this in my toolbox, and I'm proud to say that I've made it myself. Maybe this inspired some of you to try and build something like this to help you out in your own work, and if it did, that's awesome. In any case, one final thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. That's all I have for you this year. I hope to see you in 2024. Goodbye.